Welcome back, I'm John Furrier here, host of theCUBE at our New York Stock Exchange CUBE studios. Of course, we got our Palo Alto series connecting Wall Street and Silicon Valley tech and money as the world changes, as AI factories and large scale infrastructure and more data centers being built, the chips are getting faster, smaller, cheaper, um, large scale up and scale out systems are now coming on. Data centers, which were a bunch of machines are now one unit, a supercomputing. We are living in the supercomputer era and that is going to power this entirely new AI native applications. And with that transformation, you're going to have people that are going to transform and net new capabilities. So to break this uh, AI factory future of the data center down, Sid Dag is here, former Gardner analyst for over a decade, now on his own, got his own capabilities, new firm. Sid, great to see you. Last time I talked to you, you were a Gardner analyst. We were with a company called Emma at yep. AWS. You're now out on your own. Taconix yeah. is the name of the yeah. firm. Yeah, yep. That's great, congratulations. Thank you, thank you. Um, super awesome, and you cover the area. We're sort of like Gardner for over a decade, and before that you've been in computing. You know this market. Um, the, compu the computer revolution was storage, networking, and compute, then hyperconvergence came. Yeah. Um, then you had hyperscalers, okay. Then you have, now we introduced, not introduced, but we've been discussing a fourth pillar, compute, networking, storage, and database. Mm. If you look at Oracle, they're launching data centers. I'm like, what does Oracle have to do with open AI? They're, so you start to see that the data, the role of the data, the large scale data centers uh, with all the CapEx is, is top of mind. Of course, some say it's a blue bubble. I think it is certainly bubblicious. It's got some risk there. But this is pointing to the infrastructure change that's needed for the scale. NVIDIA calls it AI factories. Dell adopted that. I love the name because it implies stuff's pumping out. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like the better processor's better, right? Yeah. Remember the old days, Intel? So what, what is your analysis? Because if you look at the macro, you know, cloud was great, multi-cloud, we cover that. Sure, multiple clouds, but now you have this data center neo-cloud thing going on, being built, but also the enterprises are looking at on-premise, because that's where their data is. So now you have cross environment. So what's your take on this? Set the stage for us. What's your assessment? Yeah, so I think uh, I think you absolutely put it correctly here, right? I mean, the world is kind of exploding with data, right? Think about what happened when chat GPT got for introduced first in the in this planet, right? Yeah. People went crazy and these LLMs of frontier models are massive in size, right? But I think when you think about the enterprise trying to adopt all these technologies, they run into a lot of barriers, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, what the real problem is. If you've read the, I think everyone's read the MIT study, 95% of AI projects are failing, right? <laughs> and I think they're failing because there's a lot of technology around us. And I think the, the do you, first of all, do you believe that to be true? That study, or you think I mean, it's I don't just know if a it's sample? As, I don't, and it's natural. I, I, we see yeah, data. I don't know if it's as high as ninety-five percent, but I do know that there's a big chasm between what the vendors are doing, spending five hundred trillion dollars a year building all the data centers, AI data centers, and what the buyers are looking for. And the buyers are looking for, hey, that's great, you guys are doing all that, but for me as a CIO to take that infrastructure that you're building on my behalf or for me to use instead of a rented model like the cloud model, I need to make sure that whatever I'm deploying with that infrastructure helps me build a better outcome, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of think it's less about focusing on the hardware and the infrastructure from an AI factory perspective, but the AI factory should really think about how do you drive a scalable intelligence environment yeah. for the CIO. Well, that's what's going to really drive the adoption of AI, and that's what's going to drive the, cons drive the consumption of these AI data centers that people are spending trillions of dollars on, right? Mm -hmm. So I think of it as a data input, right? You've got the model training, you've got the, all the orchestration engines, you've got the digital applications that outcomes a scalable, intelligent recommendation, right? Mm -hmm. And the nice thing about building a, and it's not like this is not something new, right? Yeah. CIOs have been doing that forever. They hire smart people on their staff, and these guys go and do it. But that's a very asymmetric process. Why is it asymmetric? Because each person has their own way of doing yeah. it, and the output they get is similar, but not exactly the same. 
Whereas in AI factory, that whole damn thing gets automated and it's yeah. predictable, it's efficient, it's scalable. There's governance issues around it. There's cost savings around it. And that's what the CIO is looking for. Give me an AI factory that drives scalable intelligence. Don't talk about the hardware, the chips, and this and that like Dell and NVIDIA are doing, in my opinion. Yeah, you like the factory idea. I like the factory idea. I yeah, like I the, do too. Yeah, yeah. And I think Dell and NVIDIA get, like, look at the old days of selling servers are gone. But then to quote Larry Ellison from his famous Churchill Club speech where he said, the cloud is just a bunch of servers. That you know, Dell is still selling more servers in the factory because the factory needs servers. <laughs> they just configure differently. <laughs> yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. That's important stuff. Dell's got to build that. NVIDIA's got to build that. But yeah. the, the integration of all that to drive that output, which is scalable intelligence, for me as a CIO, to get the outcome that I'm looking for, that helps me, you know, drive my revenue stream. Yeah, it's called outcomes. Efficiency. It's called outcomes. That's right. Yeah, and this is why I like your comment, because I think, again, this is really nuanced, but I want to kind of just stay this for a second. This is the evolution, and this is what people, I, some people don't get. NVIDIA and Dell sell stuff. Uh, NVIDIA's got chips and, and hardware and ton of software with CUDA and other things. Um, Dell sells service, which is now a lot of software. Talk to John Rose, we'll say the same thing. But they're in that game. So a, a data factory is just designed to be one supercomputing, which is a collection of servers. When you had a server, you'd open up the, the hood, it's like a motherboard, a processor, other chips. I mean, they had stuff in there. There was subsystems and systems in there. So I think it's smart for Dell and NVIDIA and others to think of it holistically to abstract out the normal gear mindset of selling hardware to go and saying AI factory. And that's why I like it too. It's like, it's simple to understand. Give me a factory. It's going to pump out tokens and value. Yeah. Okay. You had me at hello. Okay, good. Now what runs on the factory? This is kind of where we're at. So super important to explain that they still got to innovate and video still got to innovate. So does the Dells, but the next question is, okay, I'm a customer. What are they saying to you? You talk to a lot of clients and practitioners. What are you seeing from the customer standpoint on the AI factory? Because I'm hearing startups want to run on the factories, which is basically Dell and NVIDIA, or NVIDIA only, or Dell only. So what is the operating system? I mean, we heard Jensen Wong say that KV Cash is the operating system of the, day, of the AI factory. He said that on stage at GTC. And I'm like, whoa, that's networking. Mm -hmm. How does networking become an OS? Well, when you look at the big picture, it's connecting the Blackwells together. Mm -hmm. The interconnect is the coordination and links and loads, all the resource. That, to me, passes the operating to system test. Yeah, I mean, this kind of reminds me of the, you know, the cloud <laughs> days, right? What is cloud? Everybody talked about cloud being an operating model. Yeah. It's not a physical thing. It's not a service. It's a model, an operating model. And that's what the CIOs were looking for, right? And they got that from the cloud. So now as you sort of fast forward to the AI world, yeah. the same thing, you know, what is the AI operating model for me, right? And what is it? I mean, that is the factory, right? Yeah. If I can get an operating model using all these AI technologies, be it, be it you know, fine tuning, training, inferencing, all the data inputs from multiple sources, whether it's sitting in LLM or all the databases of records and CMDBs that I have, which I want to input into the model. I want to create a domain-specific SLM that is pertinent to my industry, my specific company. And that is used to do this training, inferencing, and fine-tuning. And then furthermore, I have all the orchestration engines. I have all the tools, the picks and shovels that is integrated into the factory, right? And the ro robots, quote-unquote, that gives me this output that I can go and say to my to my people within the company, hey, this is what the recommendation as a CIO I'm making to you mm -hmm. to change your way that you operate. To me, that's a successful outcome of AI, right? If that that's the way that the world can think about it and all the vendors can yeah. respond to that, I think that's a winning ticket, yeah. right? And, and I was talking to a customer, you know, they, I totally agree with you, by the way, and, and customers will validate that. I was talking to a customer of these vendors, an end user, they call them, like a, like a company. Um, and they said, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, meaning every enterprise is different. So it looks like a one-off, but it's not. They have a, a unique needs. They got workflows, they got data, um, and they're not going to leave the cloud anytime soon, but they're also not going to want to move their data with them. If they can put an AI factory in the on-premise activity, that's great. Now, not all data centers will have the power requirements to run you know, uh, uh, the super chip, the Blackwell, and all these chips, but they'll use a Neo Cloud. This I just interviewed um, Tomorrow AI, a great company. They're highly focused on AI acceleration as a managed service. But now you have the combination of these Neo Clouds. So 
what's your what's your vision on that? Because I think this is interesting. Because if you look at the on premises market, it was if you the mental model used to be a big data center and glass house in the old mainframe days, power in a building, but not necessarily that anymore. It's just yeah. single tenant, fully secure. But I got I'll go where the GPUs are. If, if Core Weave got some GPUs, I'll take them. Yeah. Tomorrow yeah. AI's got I think I think I think the vendors are very caught up in the innovation uh, growth. And I think that's right that's the right thing for them to do. But I think you also have to step back and think about how do the consumers, which is the end users, are gonna view all that, right? So in other words, I'll give you a simple example. Let's say I go and invest in a particular frontier model, like, I don't know, lower from Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. Six months later, I decide, no, that was not the right thing for me. I want to go with Gemini for, with Vortex AI for, with Google, right? We don't have tools today to roll back that investment and to roll into the new world. Everyone is looking forward, but they're not thinking about how to make this thing backward compatible, right? <laughs> I'll give you another example. You know, I go to a vendor conference and hear about 15,000 different flavors of GPUs and CPUs and TPUs to support. But if I'm a CIO, I'm bringing an AI workload. You know what? I should have to go and figure out which GPU and TPU to use. Serve it up for me. Like the functions capability or serverless. Yeah. Maybe call it silicon-less, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Make, so those are the... Make it easy. Make it easy. He's the easy button. So give me those practical capabilities on top of all the fantastic innovations you're doing, Mr. Vendor. Give me those things. So it makes my yeah. adoption journey simple. I call that the part of the factory. Yeah. Sid, it's great to have you on. You are now officially a contributor on the Cube research team and Cube TV digital you. program. You're so awesome. You've got such great experience. Um, and you got your own firm out there now. Um, give a, put a plug in. What's the focus? What are you targeting? What's the, what are some of your objectives with the new opportunity that you're pursuing? Obviously, um, you're a seasoned veteran. <laughs> you got a clean sheet of paper. So no, give us the, give us the, the opportunity first of all. So the, you know, appreciate that. You know, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to do is sort of look at the world a little bit differently than what I did when I was a gardener, right? There was a very structured mechanism and that's good. That's, that has value. There's no doubt about it. But I'm bringing to the table now with this new um, thing of mine or this new uh, opportunity that I form. Yep. It's really all my learnings from when I was a Bell Labs researcher, right? I was a scientist and researcher. You know, the uh, uh, Jan LeCun was in the same division as me in Homedale, New Jersey, right? It's kind of funny, right? Uh, I mean, so I learned a lot then. Yeah. And then I went on to work for a company like Dell and I worked for Cisco and all these vendors, right? I, I was a general manager and I was a practitioner. So I'm bringing those findings yeah. into the equation. And then, of course, I learned a lot at being an analyst at Gardner. So it's a mix of all those experiences pot, that yeah. I'm bringing. Yeah. And I, I'm hoping that I can combine all of those learnings in my, throughout my career to bring a unique perspective to my clients and help them, as I call it, help the world build better products and services. That's my yeah. tagline. Yeah, make it make society better. Well, we we'll certainly love to tap you on this AI fact. We're also doing a robotics AI series. Uh, of course, we had our mixture of expert series, which is always fun. Um, putting together a real good trust network here and the Cube, and also the NYSE Wired community, which is an open network of, of players, leaders. So thanks for being part of the community. Appreciate it. Thanks Thank for Thank you, John. On. And congratulations for getting this NYSE studio going. Yeah, it's yeah, an amazing it's, thing. We got New York and Palo Alto. We're going to pump finance money up to Silicon Valley and money content and bring tech content here. By the way, huge community in New York, too, by the oh, way. Course. I mean, yeah, yeah. migration. It's a great tech scene here. So it's just, we love it. So it's an access point, two hubs. All right. Fantastic. We're doing our part connecting Silicon Valley and Wall Street, but also bringing in our community because getting the word out, telling the stories to understand what an AI factory is or even understand these large shifts need real expertise in domain expertise or a mixture of experts. We're doing our part. Thanks for watching. All right. All right. Thank you. Yeah, we'll bring you in. So AI factory, we should have you be a set piece because what I want to do with AI factories next, this is not, this is not 